Good morning, 10 a.m. Well, 10.30, really. Good morning, church. Good morning, Crosswalk. I was told it was going to be a lot of people at the 10.30, but dude, there's a lot of you. Oh, my gosh. I can't even see the whole of you, but I can sense you. It's a great joy and a true privilege to be with you today, this morning. I'm a huge, huge fan of what you guys do here. I've been a huge fan of your pastoral team, your leadership team, for a long time. Tim, I'm sure Tim doesn't remember this, but I met Tim 10 years ago when I was just a kid. Um, and he came to England to do the, you know, <clears throat> to speak at the camp meeting. And I was sat and listening to this guy, you know, majority of the people at the, you know, at the camp meeting were black, and so this white guy in front of us talking, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh my gosh, is he still talking about Jesus? Because this is amazing. I was like, wow. First interaction with a guy, great speaker. I was like, you know what? I need to tell him how excited I am about his word. And so I decided to follow him throughout the camp meeting. Follow him around, like, is this my chance? No, it's not. Is this my chance? It was a little creepy, I know. But, <laughs> but eventually, I see him walking out with one of my friends who's a pastor. And so they're walking, I'm like, this is my chance. Bobby's gonna introduce me to Tim. And so I'm going, and before I get there, Tim stops walking, holds Bobby back and says, this guy's wearing boat shoes. And he starts mocking me for wearing boat shoes. And seriously, I cowered it away and I left. Um, if Tim, Tim, if you're listening, just so you know, you know nothing about shoes. Those shoes were swag. <laughs> Tell your pastor. <laughs> I've got it. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Tim. Um, it's a great joy. It's true. It's a true joy to be here. I'm going to go uh, through the passage for today. If you've got your Bible, open them. They're going to be on the screen as usual. It's a big chunk, so please follow in with me. Romans chapter 8, verse 18 to 30. We continue with our series. I am sure that our suffering now cannot compare with the glory that will be shown to us. In fact, all creation is eagerly waiting for God to show us our true selves. Everything in creation is being held back. God reigns in it until both creation and all the creatures are ready and can be released into the glory that is to come. But meanwhile, meanwhile, the joyful anticipation deepens. We know that all creation is still groaning and is in pain like a woman about to give birth. The Spirit makes us sure about our future, but for now, for now, we groan graciously while we eagerly wait to be shown that we are children of God. Somebody say amen. amen. This means that our bodies will be also set free. For it's in this hope that we are and we were saved. The hope that is seen is not hope at all. Who hopes for what they've already gotten? We hope for what is to come, and we do so. Surely we do so patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit groans for us in unknown ways. And the one, the one who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance to God's will. We know that God is always at work for the good of all who love God. We are the chosen one for greater purpose. God knew everything from the very beginning. God decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love along the same lines as the life of the Son, Jesus. The one who stands first in the line of humanity, restored. And those God chose, God called. Those God called, God justified. And those God justified, God glorified. Pray with me. Oh God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your love and for your grace. Our hearts are eager for more. Our minds and our ears are eager for your revelation. Meet us today where we are. Enrich us once again, we pray. 
Amen. This is Kafka. Kafka is our uh, five-month-old multi-poo. Amazing dog. Smart, cute, obviously. Duh. Um, but before, before we had Kafka, so let's say about three months ago, before my wife and I decided to get Kafka, Kafka and I had the most amazing of times. We lived the best life. I'd wake up in the morning and I'd grab Kafka and we'd go out for a walk to the park. We'll talk about the weather, we'll smell the roses, talk about the lilies and the sparrows, and then we'll get home, get breakfast and go to work. And I'll be sat on my desk, working on my next sermon, and, and, and Kafka will be set, sat in his little basket, reciting Rumi. <laughs> Amazing. After a long day of productive work, we'd go back home and go out for a run. I'd be running, trying to lose some weight. And he'll be running in front of me looking back like, Uriel, you can do it. Encouragement. Uriel, you can do it. Two more miles. Two more miles, you can do it. And I'll be out of breath, but I'll be like, oh, Kafka, you are God's scent. <laughs> we had the best of life. It was amazing. And it lasted for a long while until, until my wife and I decided to actually get a real dog. <laughs> <laughs> and we got this chief. <laughs> Now, he's amazing, as I said, he's smart, but <laughs> guys, he ruined my furniture. <laughs> the table was ruined, the chair's ruined. He ruined our carpet. We've got to get a new one. He ruined our friend's carpet. <laughs> one time he decided to go to the toilet at someone's, on someone's couch at someone's house. Another time he decided to go to the toilet in Target. It's the middle of the aisle, and he wasn't going to clean it up. <laughs> Have you tried taking a five-month-old dog for a walk? Every two steps, you've got to drag him away from dirt. You can't take him to the park unless you're ready to watch him because he'll eat anything he finds on the floor, every single thing. We just spent over $1,000 for one night in intensive care, <coughs> intensive care, sorry, because... He ate something he shouldn't have. He's a mess. My life's a mess. <laughs> now, am I saying that I want to return him? Oh, sorry. Oh, dog's broken. I need a new one. <laughs> no, I'm not. I love him. His family. He's my boy. It's my G. All right? But do I miss the Kafka of my dreams? Absolutely. Every day. <laughs> Would I rather have the dream than have the actual dog? That's a tough one. <laughs> Not gonna lie, it's a tough one. Because sometimes, sometimes the dream is better than reality. Sometimes we prefer to hope than to actually have. Are oh, you tracking crosswalk? We do. It's part of the human experience. It's true to our nature. Do you remember Matthew 16? The Messiah was gonna come, the Messiah was gonna come, the Messiah will come. Every extra year that they had to wait, every extra day that they had to wait added to the anticipation, added to the excitement, added to the thrill, the Messiah will come. And the Messiah came, and when he came, what happened? <laughs> Are you sure you're the Messiah? <laughs> Are you sure you're not Jeremiah? Back to life. It was easier to believe that the prophet resurrected made their way all the way back to the Holy Land than it was to believe that the one that you had been waiting for, the one that you sang about, the one in whom you put your hope and trust in had come. Sometimes we prefer to hope than to actually have. And I understand why. I do. I do. Because the thrill, the excitement is in the anticipation. It's in the hope. It's in the dream. That's where the excitement is. Have you noticed that Christmas Day is the saddest day of Christmas? <laughs> Am I lying? It's true. Months of waiting, months of anticipating, planning, 
Calling your parents, telling them, okay, I'm going to fly home at 3.30 on the 23rd. Make sure someone is there to pick me up. You got your dates mixed up last year. I was waiting there for five hours. Just please make sure. Honey, please write this down. <laughs> Fully glasses on it, you're writing down. 3.30. Everyone bursting with excitement. Oh, the kids are going to be home. It's going to be amazing. Oh, we're going to get home and just relax for a bit before we go back to school. The kids are like, present, present, food, food. And so you get together, you decorate the tree, you bake together. And on the day, on the day, the presents are opened. The hugs are shared. The turkeys cut into pieces, carved, eaten, packed away for sandwiches. And you look at your watch, it's 2.30. And you're like, well, I'm going to take a nap. You're going to take a nap? Months of preparation, month of anticipation, hours of stress into planning, and when it comes, you're going to take a nap because the thrill is in the hope, the thrill is in the dream, the thrill is in the anticipation. Sometimes reality doesn't live up to the hype. Sometimes Christmas Day doesn't live up to the Christmas hype because the Christmas hype is in here. In your mind, it's perfect. You're going to do A, B, C, D, and everyone's going to be so excited. And when the day comes, someone's late. Someone forgot the principal ingredient. Someone doesn't want to help out. The stress and excitement quickly turns into sly remarks, hurt feelings. I'm gonna take a nap, I'll sit this one now, thank you very much. We get it, we understand that between what's in the mind, between what is hoped for and dreamed for and the reality of its achievement, there's a huge gap. In the mind, it's tidy, it's perfect. In real life, when you're fulfilling it, it's tough, it's clunky, it's clumsy, it's messy. And so, you don't understand that sometimes I prefer to hope than to actually have. It's messy, it's messy, having is messy. One of the saddest truths of the human experience is that life's promise is often, is too often lost in the poverty of its achievement. It is. I called a friend of mine about two weeks ago, hadn't spoken to him in a while, and I called him like, Chris, what's up, man? It's been a while, how are you doing? Really good, I'm like, how's your project going? And he's like, what project? I'm like, you know, your house project. So two years ago, he inherited a house multiple rooms, big house, and instead of putting it out for rent or selling it, he decided, you know what, I'm going to go into the community and find out who doesn't have a house, and I'm going to tell them, come and live for free. And so he went to the streets and said, guys, come, come, I've got a room, we'll help you for, you know, how to get a job, and you know, I'll feed you what I can, and it was amazing. Within two weeks, the house was packed. And so when I told him, yeah, the house project, it's like, oh, bro, bro, we had to shut it down. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, bro, like, the people started fighting all the time. They were stealing his TVs, his toasters, and everything they could get their hands on. The house started smelling really bad, so the neighbors complained. Cops were in and out looking for drugs. He's like, it got too much. It got too much, so we had to shut it down. In your mind, altruism. In your mind, philanthropy, humanitarian acts. In your mind, taking responsibility for the community. In your mind, caring for people who can't care for themselves. In your mind, love, love, love. But in reality, neighbors' complaints, theft, fights, things gone missing. You gotta shut it down. It's tied in here. But down there in the ground, it's messy. And we don't like messy. We don't, let's be honest, we don't. And no one is more aware of this fact than Paul is as he writes this letter to the Romans. You see, Paul knows something. Paul knows that he's writing to people who live in the center of imperial Rome. And Paul knows that when you live away, when you live away from the margins, you forget that life is messy. When you live away from the margins, you forget 
that some people have to deal with mess. That is the human experience, because you found ways to avoid the mess. That's my little mess dance. You found a way. And support tells them, no, 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 no. I know your instinct is to move away from the mess, but you know what? Messy is good. Somebody say amen. Meet your neighbor, tell them, oh, messy is good. It is, Paul says it is. And he paints this, this beautiful picture. Well, it's not, it's beautiful, it's messy, all right? He paints a picture of a woman giving birth. And he says, the whole creation groaning in labor pains. And the temptation, the temptation is to get stuck on the word pain. Oh yeah, birthing. Oh, it's painful, it's painful. But to, to, to solely reflect on the pain is to miss out this broader picture. Because we all know that birthing is more than pain. It is pain, but it's also hard work and labor. And it's also bringing forth a new life. That's what birthing is. Yes, it's pain, but it's hard work to bring forth a new reality, a new creation. Paul says it's a messy process. It's always going to be messy. It's never easy. But it's the only way you bring forth a new creation. There is no glory without stepping into the mess. There isn't. He gets it. He gets it. And it's a subtle but significant truth. It's a truth that moves us away from the fear of what's messy. It moves us away from avoiding what is clunky, what is difficult, to move away from the tension. It's an invitation to step into a process that is life-given an invitation to participate in creation. That's Paul's hope. That's true hope. Because the other thing is delaying. It's postponing. It's not hoping. No, no, we, wouldn't, we don't prefer to hope than to have. No, we prefer to postpone. We prefer to delay than to actually step in the mess and work hard and bring forth this new thing that God is calling us into. And so he says, no, 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 don't avoid the mess. Lean into it. And you know what is the most beautiful part of this text, you guys? It's that Paul paints a picture of a God who calls creation into partnership. It's not enough for God to save us. It's not enough for Jesus to save you from your situation. He says, no, 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 I'm going to save you, but we're going to do more. I'm calling you to something better. You're going to participate with me in this recreation. It's a partnership. In Eastern Orthodoxy, they call this theosis, the divinization of creation, where creation share the glory of God. We don't just bask in the glory. We don't just revel in God's glorious light. Paul says, we are glorified with God. Amen. Creation partaken in the divine act of creation. Wrap your mind around that. That's the calling. That's the calling. Can you think of a greater expression of grace than that? Can you? I can't. That little me is saved. And then little me is called to participate, to be buddies with the creator, let's work on this together. It's crazy, it's crazy. It's a difficult concept to understand. It is. Our predicament, our dilemma is that for so long, we have been taught that where Christ is, there is no misery and there is no suffering, there is no mess. And it takes us a while, it takes us a while to realize, well, no, it's not like that. It takes us a while to realize that where there is mess, where there is misery, where there is suffering, that is where you will find Christ. It's a turnaround of an ideology. And it's one that takes time to really grasp. The disciples struggled with it. They struggled with it. They didn't get it. 
They came to Jesus and they said, Rabbi, Rabbi, Lord, Lord, show us the glory of God. You are the Messiah, show us the glory of God. And Jesus said, you want to see the glory of God? Yeah. They brought this dirty, blind person in front of him from the street corner. Eyes filled with mucus, been blind all his life. And Jesus grabbed some dirt, spat in his own hands, rubbed it, and plied it on the guy's eyes. And the guy saw her again. And the disciples were like, well, that's, 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 that's fancy, that's exciting, but what about the real glory? Show us the real thing. And so Jesus took them to the slums. He sat with the orphans, sat with the lepers, sat with the widows, fed them. And the disciples were like, yeah, but where's the glory? Where's the glory? You know the, the glory that you've been talking about? Where is it? And do you know what Jesus did? The most amazing thing. He grabbed the towel, grabbed the basin of water, and he started washing their feet. And he was freaked out. They were like, no, 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 no. What are you doing? What are we doing? We don't want that. We want the glory. That's what we want. And Jesus said, are you sure? They're like, yes. Are you sure? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Show us the glory. And so he picked up the cross and went up the hill. And as he was hanging up there, he was hanging up there. He looked down and says, do you get it now? Do you get it now? Do you get it now? This is the glory of the kingdom. It took them a while. I, I know you guys get it. I do. I know Crosswalk gets that. My prayer for you guys, my prayer today is that this simple but significant truth, I, I pray that this truth gets you through your own mess, that it gets you through your own suffering, but also that it does more, that it becomes the foundation of your hope, true hope. And that one day, when people will look around them and see the misery of their own life, they'll find Jesus and they'll find crosswalk. Somebody say amen. Because you guys get it. You guys get it. Where Christ is, there must be misery around. Pray with me, crosswalk, pray with me. Lord Almighty, you are just so amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for calling us into this, this place where we're no longer just sinners, but we're saved, but we're no longer just saved. We participating in what you're doing in this world. That we become one with you. Like a child is one with the parent. Continue to bless us, continue to love us, and continue to inspire us with your grace and your spirit that we may find people in the suffering and represent your name, your glory on earth. In your name I pray. Amen.